on the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Alice Bryant, Anna Mateo, and Mario Ritter. Later, Steve Ember will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is Alice Bryant. Firefighters in the western United States have a new force on their side, Baby Yoda. A five-year-old boy from Oregon and his grandmother gave a Baby Yoda figurine to a donation center for firefighters on September 12th. With it was a note that read, Here is a friend for you in case you get lonely. Since then, Baby Yoda has been to four wildfires in two states. The creature has flown in helicopters, tested people's temperatures for signs of the disease COVID-19, and even used the force to move a firefighting tool. A Facebook page called Baby Yoda Fights Fires has been documenting his trips and spreading smiles far and wide. More than 30,000 people and counting are following the page as he travels from crew to crew. It is unbelievable how one small action can create a wave of kindness, said Sasha Tinning. The 54-year-old Oregon woman saw the baby Yoda while buying things to donate to the firefighters. Her grandson, Carver, was with her at the time. I turn around and this baby Yoda is just looking right at me. And he was so cute, Tinning told the Associated Press. She said to her grandson, maybe we should take this to the firefighters. The boy agreed and said that the creature could be their friend. And I thought, Everyone needs a friend, especially now, Tinning said. She wrote a note to that effect to the firefighters, and her grandson signed it. The note is still with Baby Yoda today, safely inside a small plastic bag on his back. Also on the note is the telephone number of Tyler Eubanks, the horse dentist organizing donations to the firefighters. She presented Baby Yoda to them and is now operating the Facebook page. As the firefighters take pictures of Baby Yoda's travels, they send Eubanks the pictures so she can put them on Facebook. The pictures have brought smiles to a lot of locals. Jackie Whitman lives in Columbia City, Oregon. On the Facebook page, she recently wrote that she looks for new posts several times during a normal day. Diane Arzent also watches the page. She wrote, Baby Yoda and a little boy are spreading so much love and happiness all over. Keep the force going. Tyler Eubanks cannot believe the reaction. She said she thinks our troubled times helped fuel Baby Yoda's popularity. They're having fun and it's taking stress out of a very dark situation. Wildfires in the western U.S. have burned millions of hectares destroyed homes, and killed people, including firefighters. 
Firefighters have the difficult job of walking through rural areas and forests, digging fire lines, and working 16 hour days. And they are away from their families for weeks. For them, Baby Yoda is more than just a plaything. He has been lifting people's spirits, said Sergeant Jabin Drake, a firefighter with the Oregon Air National Guard. He put an American flag on Baby Yoda's head. A lot of people on my crew, I showed them the note and everything, and they just loved it, Drake said. A few people even started to cry. It just really meant a lot to us, and it was really emotional for a lot of people. Drake said it was extra special for him as a longtime Star Wars fan who also loves the Mandalorian television show. Baby Yoda first appeared on that program and quickly became a big hit on the Internet. T.J. Ramos is an Air Tactical Group Supervisor with the Oregon Department of Forestry. He has taken selfie pictures with Baby Yoda in his helicopter. And he took Baby Yoda on a flight over Oregon's Holiday Farm Fire on September 21st. Ramos remembers when he got to announce to crews at the fire's helicopter base that Baby Yoda had arrived. By then, the gifted figurine was famous among all the fire crews. You could immediately see everyone feel a little better. Some smiles came on some straight faces, and it was a different day, Ramos said. He said it was just a lift to everyone and added almost a connection to home life. Baby Yoda is now so in demand after his trips through Oregon and Colorado that fire crews from other states and Canada have asked that he join them. I'm Alice Bryant. From VOA Learning English, this is the Health and Lifestyle Report. At a university in the United States, people infected with the new coronavirus are part of an experiment. The subjects put their faces into the big end of a large cone-shaped device. Then they say the alphabet and sing or just sit quietly for half an hour. The cone captures everything that comes out of their mouths and noses. The device is helping researchers study a big question. Exactly how does the virus that causes COVID-19 spread? The Associated Press recently reported on the study at the University of Maryland. The coronavirus has been known to link up with small liquid particles released by an infected person. People expel particles when coughing, sneezing, singing, talking, and even breathing. But these droplets come in any number of sizes. The University of Maryland researchers are attempting to identify how risky the different sizes are. Since the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic, public health officials have been concerned about larger particles from the coronavirus. 
But some scientists are now studying smaller particles, the ones that spread like cigarette smoke. These particles, called aerosols, can stay in the air for minutes to hours. They can spread throughout a room and build up if air ventilation is poor. At one time, the World Health Organization did not think that aerosols were a danger, except in some medical situations. But later, WHO experts said that the spread of the virus through aerosols could not be ruled out in crowded and poorly ventilated indoor spaces. Some health officials have been saying one way to avoid getting sick is to keep at least two meters away from other people. Other officials say about half that distance is safe. These suggestions are based on the idea that larger particles fall to the ground before they can travel very far. For aerosols, notes researcher Lindsay Marr, two meters does not guarantee protection. Marr is studying coronavirus particles at the Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University. Marr told the Associated Press she thinks infection by aerosols is happening a lot more than people initially were willing to think. To prove this, she and others point to what they call super-spreader events. This is an event where one infected person may have passed the virus to many others. Jay Butler is Deputy Director for Infectious Disease at the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. He says the CDC continues to believe larger, heavier droplets that come from coughing or sneezing are the main method of transmission. But he added that more research may change that finding. Butler said super-spreader events raise concerns about aerosol spread. But they do not prove it. There could be another way for very small particles to spread. At the University of California, researchers found that small droplets do not have to come directly from an individual's mouth or nose to infect. They found that when influenza virus is left on paper tissues, those papers can give off particles of the virus. So researchers say anyone emptying a container with tissues containing COVID-19 should wear a face mask. Scientists who warn about aerosols say that current health advisories still make sense. Wearing a mask is still important. Make sure it covers the lower half of your face. Keep washing your hands. And again, staying farther apart is better than being closer together. Avoid crowds, especially indoors. But experts say another big issue is air ventilation. Try to avoid a buildup of aerosol particles by staying out of poorly ventilated rooms. When possible, open windows and doors. Keep air moving and use air purifying devices. The best advice, researchers say, is do as much as you can outdoors. Droplets do not build up in open air environments. And the sun's ultraviolet light can also kill the coronavirus. Jose Luis Jimenez is a researcher at the University of Colorado, Boulder. He says that being outdoors is the most effective protective measure. He added that while it is not impossible to get infected outdoors, it is difficult. 
And that's the Health and Lifestyle Report. I'm Ana Mateo. And I'm Mario Ritter. Are you at risk of getting seriously ill from the new coronavirus? Here are some things to keep in mind. 80% of coronavirus cases are mild. Young and healthy people are at low risk. Other people and those with serious health conditions have a greater risk of serious illness or even death. If you have a cough, fever, and difficulty breathing, contact a doctor and stay away from other people. For more information, visit the World Health Organization website at www.who.int or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at www.cdc.gov. From VOA Learning English, welcome to The Making of a Nation. I'm Steve Ember. Last time, we talked about the Amistad case. The Amistad was a slave ship from Cuba. In 1839, it appeared off the eastern coast of the United States. The Africans on the ship had killed white crew members including the captain. They demanded to go back home to Africa. But the two remaining slave traders on the ship secretly sailed the Amistad toward the United States. The U.S. government put the Africans in a low-security prison in New Haven, Connecticut, and it made plans to take the Africans to court. A judge would decide whether the occupants of the ship were slaves who had rebelled, murderers, or captives who had been kidnapped from their homes. The Amistad case brought attention once again to the issue of slavery in the United States. At the time, slavery was legal and an important part of the country's economy. But the U.S., and several European countries had banned the international slave trade. A small group of activists wanted to totally end slavery. They believed slavery was a sin. But in the 1830s, most Americans did not support these anti-slavery activists known as abolitionists. Most Americans, first of all, were racist and secondly, saw these people as utter fanatics who were intent on destroying the Union. Julie Roy Jeffrey is a professor of history at Goucher College in Maryland. She says newspapers reported on the Amistad case and people began talking about slavery and the slave trade. Slowly, some Americans' feelings toward the abolitionist movement and enslaved Africans changed. For example, there was a play put on in New York City called The Black Schooner that was based on the Amistad incident. And there were many, many people who went to see it. It became a popular event. And wax figures of the captives were exhibited in various places in the United States, and artists drew pictures of them. The abolitionists wanted to make more Americans sympathetic to the Amistad Africans. They found lawyers to represent them, paid tutors to teach them, and organized outdoor exercises to keep them healthy and visible. Howard Jones taught history at the University of Virginia. He says one of the most popular members of the Amistad Africans was an eight-year-old boy who had learned English. The boy told the public about his life in Africa and about the conditions on the slave ship that brought him across the Atlantic Ocean. The Amistad case also was increasingly becoming a political issue. 
People wanted to know what President Martin Van Buren was going to do about the case. Historian Howard Jones says Van Buren found the position difficult. He did not want to anger Southern voters who supported slavery and wanted to make the African slave trade legal again. He also did not want to anger Northern voters who believed the Amistad Africans had been mistreated. Van Buren did what any good politician would do, and that was to try to dodge the issue, stay away from it. He couldn't understand why 40-plus, by this time, black people should affect anything happening in high political society. But the Amistad issue would not go away. The case began in a circuit court. After three days, it went to a district court. The district court judge ruled that the African slave trade was illegal under international treaties. For that reason, the Africans were wrongly taken. President Van Buren was worried the decision would cause more political problems for him, so he ordered the nation's highest court, the Supreme Court, to hear the case. The Chief Justice of the Supreme Court at that time was Joseph Story. Story did not like slavery, but he did not support the abolitionist movement either. He thought its ideas opposed the rule of law. The abolitionists had good lawyers, but they knew they needed more help arguing their case in the Supreme Court. So they turned to former president John Quincy Adams. At the time, Adams was a congressman, not an abolitionist. But he led a campaign against an 1836 rule restricting anti-slavery petitions. Adams said the rule was a violation of the constitutional right to petition Congress. Historian Julie Jeffrey says the 1836 gag rule, as it was called, helped the abolitionists' cause. It became partly a freedom of speech issue, not just about slavery, but about the rights of citizens to speak out and to be heard by their representatives in Congress. Yet John Quincy Adams was not excited about arguing the Amistad case. He was 72 years old, nearly blind, and very busy. But the issue of the Amistad Africans troubled him. Howard Jones says Adams believed capturing people and enslaving them was immoral, especially in a country like the United States. In the end, Adams agreed to defend the Africans. And he makes the argument in the court case that we have the Declaration of Independence right there on that wall, and that says that life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, it doesn't say for white people only or anything like it. He was arguing, trying to argue, that it's something that's available for everyone. It's part of the justice system. Chief Justice Joseph Story did not totally accept Adams' argument or suggest that any kind of slavery was wrong, but he did agree with the district court that these Africans had been taken illegally from their homes. They were not and had never been slaves, Justice Story said. They were free people and should be returned home. So in 1841, the remaining 30 or so members of the Amistad captives got on a ship called The Gentleman, and returned to West Africa. Howard Jones says the incident was the only time he knows that black people who had been brought to the New World as slaves actually made it back home. And how they do it by winning in the American court system. This was just unheard of. But the decision was basically that it doesn't matter whether you are black, white, purple, green, or whatever color you are, you have been kidnapped. 
And so therefore you have, and Joseph's story said this in his decision, which really opened the door for a lot of arguments, that under the eternal principles of justice, you have the inherent right of self-defense, even if you must kill your captors. Howard Jones says the Supreme Court decision also gave the abolitionists a new sense of power. And the abolitionists immediately printed pamphlets, leaflets, had talks, everything they could to show that these people went free. And their implication was this is what's going to happen to slavery itself, that this is a great victory for the black man. But the Amistad case did not really change the situation in the United States for most black people. Many were the children of slaves and could not argue that they had been kidnapped from Africa. And it was still legal to trade slaves across U.S. state borders. The Amistad case also did not solve all the problems in the abolitionist movement. Julie Roy Jeffrey says during the trials, many abolitionists worked together, including blacks and whites. It sometimes worked very well, and it sometimes didn't work so well, but it was certainly one of the, the first times that blacks and whites had worked so fruitfully together. After the Amistad victory, though, the abolitionist movement broke into different groups. Ms. Jeffrey says some black abolitionists wanted more respect from white activists. Other abolitionists just had different ideas about how best to end slavery, by trying to change the country's laws or by appealing to Americans' moral sense of right and wrong. Abolitionism did influence other movements, however. One was the missionary movement. Julie Roy Jeffrey says Christian missionaries had already been going to Africa hoping to persuade people to follow their religion. But the Amistad case and abolitionism made more people want to share their beliefs with others. Some missionaries even converted the Amistad captives to Christianity and returned to West Africa with them. Ms. Jeffrey says the abolitionist movement also helped create the women's movement in the middle of the 1800s. She says most 19th century white women mainly cared for their families in the home but women abolitionists played an important public role. They weighed in on the most political question of the day. They um, took on activities like collecting petition signatures and raising money and giving speeches. As a result, Ms. Jeffrey says, some women came to believe they had a right to develop their own beliefs and have political power. Sometimes they propped up their, um, their activism by appealing to things like the Bible. Um, one woman I remember said something like, I read my Bible and I know what it tells me. And she was opposing the minister in her church and she was a very active abolitionist. Yet, even if abolitionism still did not personally affect most Americans, it made an increasing number of people question whether they wanted slavery to continue. I'm Steve Ember, inviting you to join us next time for The Making of a Nation, American History from VOA Learning English. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.